we're going to start off our evening with giving out uh, a traditional award. We have a couple of traditional awards here in the Northeast, and I'm going to let Woody Belt take over from here to, to do that. And then after this piece, you'll we'll be doing our keynote, keynote, and then play that. So Woody, maybe you can come on up and uh, win this off. Woody Belt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It is really bright up there. So, Piku, and I'm going to read it out of here because I want to make sure I have every single thing absolutely perfect because I never make a mistake. <laughs> Piku, wait a minute, who, who knows what Piku stands for? Uh huh. Okay, the P stands for? Person. Person. The I stands for? person in charge of unlocking potential. This award is given out to every year to somebody from the Northeast who exemplifies those qualities of being able to unlock the potential in others. And if you've looked in here, you kind of know who it is already, but let me tell you a little bit of a story. <laughs> One time, a long, long time ago, in a land far, far away, there was this person who wore a uniform at a college. And then there was this other person that showed up at the college and decided he was going to do some, I don't know, some outdoor adventure kind of stuff. And it was interesting because the person wearing the uniform used to moonlight and do some, well, like to go out and hang out and do stuff in the outdoors and learn about that outdoor leadership. Well, that person who was in charge of that, friend, tapped that person on the shoulder who was wearing the uniform and said, hey, by the way, there's this guy by the name of Dan Garvey coming over. I really think you should meet him. Because you tend to go around and help those college students learn the intricacies of choice when they might be making some mistakes. <laughs> so I said, sure, I'll go see this guy. And from that point on, the uniform came off and I spent the rest of my life and career working with kids and starting it out in the outdoors. So Brent saw in somebody a person who was able to be unlocked, and Brent unlocked that person. So Brent, congratulations, come on up. It's here, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> this is really, really nice. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Um, this is about as uncomfortable as I get typically here. And uh, I, uh, those of you who know me know that I, I hate getting. I like, I like awards. I guess I just hate getting them. I don't know. They, I don't know if that makes any sense. But uh, you know, it's nice to be honored, but then it's also really uncomfortable and awkward. And I always feel that all the wonderful people that are, are deserving. Um, I have a. So, so I'm going to tell the story now of Woody. So, so Woody and I do go back. We have quite a history, and uh, and and how I remember it is that you know I was this new outdoor uh, education director, and Woody was working security, and we struck a friendship, and I got him to take my class, and uh, and he was a huge help to me, and just 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 this great uh, great outdoor leader. And plus, he was on the staff, and it was more mature, and there's a lot of benefits to that. Um, but, you know, fast forward, like, we don't really talk too much. I mean, I love the guy, and, and you should, too. I mean, everyone loves Woody. But, uh, the, uh, and if you don't, you just don't know him well enough, I guess. But the, uh, <laughs> I got this phone call in the morning, and it says, and it says Woody, and there's a Woody belt on my phone. And I'm like, and I seriously, I'm like, you know, get my wallet, you know, get everything. And I'm like, I'm expecting, it's like, I'm in jail, come bail me out. <laughs> and so I just was like, I'm ready to go. I was grabbing my car keys and I'm going to help out Woody, you know, like there's some kind of emergency. And, 
And he says, Brent, Brent, I gotta talk to you. And I'm like, I'm ready, you know. And, <laughs> you know, we wanna give you the, uh, the Piku Award, you know. And I was like, what? You know, like, this is no emergency, you know. So anyway, it was a very, very nice phone call, but very shocking and surprising to me. Um, they did say I could start of talk for five minutes, so I, and, uh, and, and I'm gonna go way over that. Now I'm, uh, now I wanna, I do, I do wanna share one story. I've been sort of talking, and, and uh, those of you who've been to Oops and been around me a lot, you've heard this story maybe two, three, four, five, or six times, but it's probably the story that, that, that uh, I like to tell because uh, it, it left a big impression on me, and I, I wanna share it. Um, and so it's, uh, I was at one time, after, after leaving Woody, and uh, moving on to other jobs, I ended up uh, at uh, Harvard working in the, at the first year outdoor program, as many of you know. And when I was at Harvard, uh, my first year there, we, have a, we had a large program of outdoor leaders. And so every year there would be, um, I don't know, 70, 80, 90 interviews of students who wanted to be, to enter the training program, enter this outdoor leadership training program. The first student they ever saw was this young woman named Haley Surdy. And, um, the first interview, I remember it well, is this wonderful, charming young woman. And I, I don't know how to describe her. She had this like, big, bright smile, and she's just one of these friendly, uh, friendly young women and just seemed like good for the world. And that's the phrase that always comes to me. Um, she, she, got, she got the leadership position. She went on to lead for, for, uh, for two, two years, led these great trips at Harvard. Uh, one of the things I like to do, I love graduation. I love ceremony, some of you know. Um, and so at graduation, I like to go around and say, and, and see all the graduating seniors. And so for those of you who haven't graduated yet from UNH, I'll be coming for you uh, on that day. But, um, but for Haley, I, last, I saw her and she was, um, she had all these little kids like grabbing at her, all, all these, you know, and she had this big smile, she got her, her robe on, and she's like, Brent, Brent, I, I'm going to South America, I'm working for Let's Go this summer. You know, but I'll be back and I'll talk to you then. And she did this big smile. I was like, Haley, congratulations. And it's so great to see you graduate. And I'd love to catch up. And, and, uh, and so she said goodbye to her family that day. She got on the bus. She went to South America. And she was in, a, in this bus accident where everyone died. The bus ran over, went off a cliff, and, uh, and there were no survivors. Um, I do know that she's sitting towards the front of the bus, um, I guess was the report, and that's about all we really knew about the bus accident. Um, and I was just devastated, um, as, as were you know, all of her friends. Um, and I was in that position too, I remember pretty clearly, uh, of having to call you know, her, uh, her co-leader, have to call her roommate, and uh, break this news. And in my sorrow, and in this, this sort of period, I didn't know what to do. I was just sitting in my office, and I pulled the staff drawer open, and I got her file out, and I just started like reading through her staff file, reading memories. And the thing that struck me at this moment is I read this story, and she talked about going on the first year outdoor program, and it said, you know, going on the first year outdoor program was the greatest experience of my life. And that was the first sentence. And to me, it was just hit me is that like we oftentimes we get to have, have people say that, but in someone's young life to actually to, to have experienced that, like this, her shortened life, one of her greatest, I don't know if it was the greatest experience, but one of them that she thought was significant was going on an outdoor orientation program. And so, to me, that was the day I really thought, like, this stuff is serious. You know, we really make a difference, and, and, and we don't know how long people's lives are gonna be, but when they're shortened, it's even more important that they've had these really wonderful, uh, powerful experiences, and so, to me, that's, that's really what, what I, I really love about outdoor orientation and want to you know, sort of dedicate a lot of time to it. I, it's what I love about the work that the people here in the audience do. And I think that that's why we're so important. And, uh, so with that, I guess, uh, for me, that's, that's really what, what keeps me going. I, a few months later, I had this sort of same scenario happen again with another one of my leaders in November. And, and, uh, and it's kind of the same thing happened where this... Uh, uh, Denny Lewis, he was in, a, in November, he was in a car accident in South America. Uh, he was going on a mountaineering trip. And afterwards, his father gave me this postcard that he had in his room, it was unfinished, and the postcard talked about how, you know, he said, he said leading, you know, in the outdoor orientation program was one of the greatest things of his life, and if he could do it for the rest of his life, he would. And, uh, and it was never mailed to me, but it was there. So I guess I just want to leave, I want to honor those two, I guess, because they really, um, 
help me kind of get up every day and, and they help me sort of realize what's important about the job we do and uh, and I want to I want to share their memory with as many people as I can because I want to hopefully that inspires you so so on behalf of that I, I'm happy to accept this and, and on behalf of of Mike and and, and Beth and, and uh, Hutch and this wonderful company uh, thank you very much display this plaque in the dining hall in an open space, maybe like the, the Elder Fire area where you can come up and see all the past recipients. Thank you for mentioning uh, Mike Esper, the, the, uh, the person who came, coined the phrase, and we honored him by giving him the first P. Coop Award right after he passed away. Um, and then Beth and Hutch and Brett, great company, great group of people doing great things for us. So uh, thank you. I'm going to introduce Parker, who's going to introduce a former Pete Cooper winner and our keynote. Hey, everybody. So, I did the great honor of introducing I, my, one of my best friends. Uh, about eight years now, uh, started out with him threatening my life. Uh, because I met him as I was dating one of his past students. Uh, he, you know, it was one of those sit downs, if you ever hurt her, and I was like, okay, and we've been happily married. Uh, but never break it off because I'm going to be threatened. Uh, I love you, I'm so sure. Uh, but so, Hutch Hutchinson, uh, or Paul, if you didn't know, <laughs> Fernando Hutchinson. <laughs> He is one of those people, as we said last year, he, won, he received the Piku. Uh, he's just one of those people who kind of weaves in and out of so many people's lives. Um, so just really quick, I'm interested, I feel like there's so many people in kind of outdoor and spiritual ed who kind of just weave through and connect with so many people. So if you've had a conference experience with Hutch or been in a workshop with Hutch or worked with Hutch, just raise your hand real quick. Awesome. It's, he's one of those people that really, again, gets to so many people and can bring so much out of so many people. Um, and I am so honored to have him as one of my best friends, best man at my wedding. Uh, I am ch his child's play toy that he like to climb all over me. Because um, he's too short, they can't get enough height. Um, but so, without any more of my rambling, I'd like to introduce our keynote for tonight, Hutch Hutch. Yes, for those of you who were able to see it in front, I did have to get on my tippy toes to hug him. <laughs> um, well, hi. How are you? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's. Uh, do I need the microphone? No. No? Good. In the back, you're good? Good. <laughs> Could be a thumb. We can't hear you. This is good. So. <laughs> It's an intimidating thing to give the keynote at AEE for, for a couple of reasons. One, because the, the, really the people in this room uh, are, are people that have really inspired me and, and, and helped me along the, the journey that I've been on all these years. And, uh, and, and, it's an, and they've done keynotes and done speeches and things that have, have, have helped broaden my view of the world. And so it's intimidating to kind of be in that role of having to, to follow in those footsteps. It's also intimidating because you can't at an AEE keynote, you can't just talk, right? You gotta do something, right? Because y'all are kind of some type of ADD at some level, and you just can't sit there for 45 minutes. You gotta do. But but here's the catch: is nor you know we all do team building and icebreakers and get people to get up and move around, but you can't do that in the keynote because the people that came up with those things are in the audience. <laughs> Nothing new, and uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that uh, what we can do tonight in the next 45 minutes or so is something new and different for, for AEE. 
uh, and, and I hope you enjoy it. I, I hope it works. My what uh, what I, T when he asked me in, at the conference in Denver in November if I would give a keynote, he, I said, "Well, what do you want me to talk about?" And because I can talk about a lot of stuff. <laughs> and he said, we wanted to talk about the intergenerational experience uh, and, and what AEE is in the way it links generations. And I was like, ooh, I can, I can do that. I can do that. And uh, <clears throat> at least I thought that now. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> One thing before I go into this, I want you to realize this is what's great about AEE. We needed a podium. We didn't have a podium. We had a trash barrel. <laughs> the leftover oops tablecloth. And style. <laughs> with, with the, they, they're filming this right now, and, and his tripod, the camera, wouldn't, wouldn't work, so it's ace bandage. <laughs> and we love these people. <laughs> So I want to start off, I want to say about the best job I ever had in my life. The best job I ever had. Um, now you'd think, somebody who works in outdoor education, the best job's going to be something like riding grizzly bears in Alaska, right? You know, or, you know, sailing around the world with a bunch of middle school students or something. Something really kind of wild, cool, outdoor adventure. And it's not. It's not that. You'd think at the very least it's going to be an outdoor job. And it was not that either. Most of when I was working this job, I was indoors. Um, very few times did I do this job outdoors. And the job was uh, as a warrior poet. Now, what that referred to was this Irish-American folk trio that I was a part of in college. Um, and as I'm sure you can imagine, the, 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 begin, the genesis of, of, I'm sure, most Irish-American folk bands <laughs> started about three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bunch of kids who grew up in, in, in families of Irish descent singing the songs that you sing at 3 in the morning. And it's like, dude, we should put a band together. And, and the, the next day, uh, one of the guys who was full of, as we would say, Blarney, uh, happened to be at this Irish pub in our, in our college town. And he was like, you know, I'm part of an Irish American folk trio. And, and that's how we got our first gig. And then we had a week to learn how to play that. Um, but what was great about the job uh, was that we, we became the house band of, of Patty O'Rourke's Irish pub and family restaurant in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And, and what that meant was we would do a full-on concert uh, once a month, maybe twice a month. But the standing deal was if we showed up and sat in a corner of the restaurant with our instruments and play, just practice, just whatever, we could eat and drink for free. <laughs> Get it, right? <laughs> it may be the highest paying job I will ever have. <laughs> it's amazing, it's amazing. But that's not why it was the best job I ever had. That's not why. The reason why came down to a guy that we would call Grandpa Avril. Now, Grandpa Avril was the, the, your classic kind of probably mid-late 70s old Irish-American guy, barrel-chested, get his hat pulled down, had his, his blackthorn shillelagh cane that he'd walk because I'm sure he could like, you know, get a regular cane from, you know, CVS or something, but the black door and you could smack people with, right? So, <laughs> so, and oh, here, one of these kind of voices, ha, ha, Jesus, ha, ha. Like, that's just how he would talk. It's great. And, and he would come with his wife, um, who, who had a very similar voice. And, <laughs> and, and, and their, their, their son and, and his son's wife, who, you know, they were, they were grown adults, and, and their, their kids, who were high school, college age folks. So the whole family would come. Every time we'd do a show, they would come. And every time, we'd do the exact same thing. We would start, we'd, we'd do a, a sound check, you know, where you're just starting a couple songs, you're just trying to get going, and, and they'd get all rowdy, and then, you know, we'd stop, because it's a sound check, right? And it's not the show, and, and we're not ready, and, and as soon as we'd stop, you know, Grandma Avery would be like, What are you doing? you got to experience the song! And we'd have to explain again what a sound check was, and profanity would be wonderful. And, and, and as the night would go on, Grandpa, at some point in time, would go to the end of the bar, and Grandma would still be at the booth, 
and, and you'd, you'd go by Grandpa and be like, oh, Jesus, she's pissed at me. Oh, look at her. Oh, Jesus. God, I love her. Oh, <laughs> oh she's mad. And you could see she was steaming at, at, at her booth, just, oh. And it's, oh, she's, oh, she's, oh. God, she's beautiful. <laughs> and you realize that this was a dance they'd been doing for 50 years. <laughs> and, and it was beautiful in that. But, but that's not why this was the best job. <laughs> we did a show one night, and at the end of the show, Grandpa came over, and I won't continue to do his voice because I won't be able to talk for the rest of the night. And, and he came up and he said, thank you. And I said, hey man, you bet. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, it was great. Glad you had fun. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't understand. Thank you. And I was like, no, this is great. Thanks, man. I just, I love that you guys came. This is awesome. I, I love seeing you guys. And, he said, no, 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 no. He said that the songs that you sang tonight were the songs that my grandmother sang to me when I was a little boy. And tonight, my granddaughter sang those songs with you and with me and with her. And thank you for that. And of course, I'm like, whoo. <laughs> That's why that was the best job I ever had. Um, the thing about growing up in an Irish-American culture, Irish-American community, is, is we learn our history, we learn our background from the music that we share. Uh, often in pubs, stereotypically, but true. Um, or in festivals, or in the car with your parents, just singing the Clancy Brothers driving around. And, and, and these kind of things teach us about centuries old traditions and legends and stories and our history. And what's beautiful about that is that wherever you go, whether you're in Boston or Philadelphia or Denver or Dubai or Sydney or London or Dublin or Galway, you can sing the same songs. And you'll find people you've never met before but grew up in that same culture, that same tradition. My family hasn't been in Ireland since 1845. Right? I'm not Irish, but I'm part of Ireland. And that's a very powerful thing. And it's a powerful thing to be able to share with my kids, who are very well aware of being Irish, for better or worse. <laughs> but it's also something I want to share with you. Um, so tonight, we're, we're going to sing together. Uh, and because the thing about this intergenerational experience is it's not about telling stories, it's about sharing experiences. It's about taking cultures and traditions and lessons and moving them forward from one generation to the next. And so that's what we're going to do. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a shanty song. Now a shanty song is a sailing tune. All right? and, and so these are often sung a cappella, which is an Italian word for I don't know the chords. Uh, <laughs> And uh, this, this particular song, the thing about a shanty song is they're work songs. A lot of the Irish worked uh, on, on sailing ships, uh, on, on the Atlantic trade and, and around the world. They were whalers, they were shippers, they were in the, in the, uh, the British Navy. And the, the music spoke to what, uh, what the culture was like on the ship. It spoke a lot about what the culture was like when they were on shore. Uh, but, they were really work songs. They were a way to keep us together and to keep us moving together. And so the shanty man, which is who I would be, uh, will call the tune. And the crew, that would be you, uh, will respond. And what we would do is this is how we would move together and keep things going together. What we're going to sing is what's called a capstan song. And a capstan is the, it's like an axle in the center of a ship. And you use it to like haul up the anchor or like big heavy stuff. Jerry, for anyone ever see you know, Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. You know that like part where they're going through the moon and they're like, whoa, and they're like the first time you see they're scary and they're like all like pushing on this thing and walking around in a circle? Yeah, that's a capstan, right? Okay. So, um, so the song is called Patty Layback. Now the way Patty Layback works is I'm gonna say it was a cold and wintry morning in December, and you'll say December, right? So if I said it was a cold and wintry morning in December, December. Yeah. And all of my money it was spent. And you're gonna say spent, spent. Okay. Good, good. Alright. We'll, we'll do the we'll do the first verse first and we'll work into it. <coughs> it was a cold and wintry morning in December. December. All of my money it was 
spent. Spent, spent. And where it all went, I can't remember. Remember. So down to the shipping office I went. Went, went. Oh, look at that. <laughs> We're all on. Who needs St. Patrick's Day? We're all on. <laughs> now the chorus goes like this. I'm going to say, Oh, Patty, lay back. And you're going to say, Patty, lay back. Patty, lay back. Patty's a derogatory term for the Irish, just so you know. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I give you. You can say it. Take up your slack. Take up your slack. And this is the cut. Yeah, you're right. Take up your slack. Yeah. Like, fine. You know? You just walk away. It's great. <laughs> now here's the tough part. All right, I'm gonna say and take a turn around the capstan, heave and ho. And you're gonna go. You ready? You're gonna go heave and ho. All right. I know. And take a turn around the capstan, heave and ho. Heave and ho. About ship station, boys, we're handy. You're gonna say we're handy. We're handy. We're bound for Valparaiso round the horn. Round the horn. All right, good. All right, you ready? Excited? There's more verses. I'm not going to tell you how to do You're just going to do it because you're going to know. All right, I got to look at the I promise this is just water. I promise. My grandparents would be so upset about that, though. It was a cold and wintry morning in December. In December. And all of my money it was spent. Spent, spent. But where it all went, I can't remember. Remember. So down to the shipping office I went. Went, went. Oh, Patty, lay back. Patty, lay back. Take up your slack. Take up your slack. Take a turn around the caps and even oh. Even oh. Out of ship station, boys, be handy. Handy. We're about to develop our eyes around the horn. Now on that day there was a great demand for sailors. Sailors. Shipping to the colonies and for France. France, France. So I signed aboard a line, he marked the Hotspur. Hotspur. And got paralytically drunk on my advance. Oh, oh Patty, lay back. Patty, lay back. Take up your slack. Take up your slack. Take a turn around the capstan, even all. Even all. ship station, boys, be handy. Be handy. We're about to develop our eyes around the hall. Now there were Spaniards and Russians and Dutchmen. Dutchmen. Johnny Cresco just got back from France. France. Not one among them spoke a word of English. English. But they answered to the call of Monk's advance. Monk's advance. Oh, Patty, lay back. Oh, Patty, lay back. Uh, take up your slack. Take, take up your slack. Take a turn around the caps and even all. Even all. Oh, oh, ship station boys behind me. Behind me. We're bound for the eyes around the hall. Some other fellas they've been drinking. Yeah. I myself was heavily on the booze. <laughs> so I sat upon me old sea chest of thinking yeah. that I should go to bed and have a snooze. <laughs> oh, Patty, lay back. Patty, lay back. Take up your slack. Take, Take up your slack. slack. Uh, turn around the caps and even all. Oh, oh, ship station boys behind me. Behind We're me. bound for the horizon around the hall.
I think AEE is also an, an intergenerational experience like that. And I think outdoor education has always been an intergenerational experience. And it's one of those things, we do it well, but I don't think we think about it enough. I'm a historian by academic training. My, my work primarily is to look at how American culture has changed over the centuries by looking at the way that we teach and how our teaching has changed. When, when you teach, what education is, is it's a focus of the values we feel most strongly. We have to pass these things on to the next generation. This is what they will need for our kids, not those kids, our kids, to survive, thrive, and be successful. This is what they cannot forget. And so when you look at how education changes, it gives you a window into what people feel and believe at that point in time. And that's what I love about studying really the evolution and the history of education, specifically outdoor education. Now, the, the example I want to share with you is that between the Boy Scouts of America and the Grand Army of the Republic. Now, the Boy Scouts, we lose sight of the beauty that the Boy Scouts offer. We lose sight by, by, by getting focused in a lot of the political issues that they're involved in and the stances that we may or may not agree with. But what's very important to realize is that there is no organization in the world that has involved more youth and that they are the strongest proponents of outdoor education in the world. They do what we do. They believe in that. And they may have other beliefs and things. But when you look back at that core and where they began and what they were about when that started, there's tremendous beauty. And, and a lot of that has to do with the intergenerational experience. The Scouts, when they began, their parents, the original Scout leaders, were wrestling with an issue. The greatest generation was passing. Now, when we hear the greatest generation, those of us who are of my age and, and, and like, well, all of us really, when we say the greatest generation, who are we talking about? World War II. World War II, right? We're talking about a, a group of people who survived the most tragic war who faced impossible odds, who succeeded, who thrived, and who made a future possible for us, right? The, that's what made them the greatest generation. But in 1910, the greatest generation were the veterans of the Union Army, who had done the same thing. They had fought tremendous <coughs> odds. They had literally gone into the breach when the United States was about to tear itself in half. They faced tremendous odds, they faced tremendous hardships, but they laid a foundation for a future that was better than what it had been before. And, and so the parents of that generation, or the, the children of those, those soldiers, asked, how do we make sure that our kids have the same character and strength and integrity that our parents had? And how do we do it in a way that does not involve the most violent, tragic means possible? How do we, to use William James's words, create a moral equivalent of war? And the way they did that was by sharing the experiences of what the Union Army, now called the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, and, and how they were reflecting on the lessons. Now, the Grand Army of the Republic the, the GAR was the legion, the American legion for Civil War veterans. <clears throat> Massive organization all across the United States. But, and they had reunions. But when they had reunions, guess what they called them? Encampments. When they got together, they went to camp. That was the term that they would use. When you read their memoirs, when you read their, their uh, newsletters, when you look at the speeches they give, they do not talk about war. They were suffering through post-traumatic stress. They had issues they were working through. What the war meant to them, what the camaraderie meant to them, was a fire burning in the distance after a long march. It was a hot cup of coffee. It was sleeping in tents. It was being together, singing songs, often Irish songs. <laughs> telling stories, playing this new game called baseball. 
that these things were part of their experience at war and the part that they felt brought them together. And it was the part that they celebrated in the years after the war. Now the Boy Scouts come into this because when the Boy Scouts start in 1910, they, uh, again, they're, you've got to figure out, we've got these kids, we're going to get them outside and do stuff. What are they going to do? Well, you know what they did? They would go on marches to be like their grandfathers. They would camp out with their grandfathers. They would hike. Uh, in, in, in 1911, uh, the scouts from North Adams, Massachusetts, hiked all the way to Adams, Massachusetts to go to the GAR Hall and look at relics of the war and talk to veterans. Because that was their adventure. That's what they would do. But it really reached its peak for me in July of 1913 at the 50th anniversary encampment of the Battle of Gettysburg. And tens of thousands of Union and Confederate soldiers returned. The Grand Army of the Republic and, and the, the Confederate Veterans Organizations came together at Gettysburg. They slept in tents. They, they were part of this experience where they wanted to not uh, relive the animosities of 50 years before, but find a way to heal themselves and the country in the process. The, the most pivotal, powerful moment was Pickett's Charge, which for those of you that may not be familiar with the battle, 15,000 Confederate soldiers uh, went out across a, a field on the third day of the battle. And then in a half hour, there were 5,000 left. And that was a, that what they call a high watermark for the Confederacy. So the highlight of this reunion was going to be Pickett's Charge, or reenactment of Pickett's Charge. And so these Union soldiers, 70, 80, 90 years old, on one end, uh, by, what, by the, the wall that the Union troops had been behind, and then partway across the field, the Confederate veterans coming across, and these old men, as they started walking, started to kind of move quicker and quicker. And the Union soldiers jumped over the wall. And they ran at each other. These 70, 80-year-old men. And they held each other in the middle of a battlefield. Now, through all of that, the first aid system, the messaging system, the folks that helped the guys off of the trains, the folks that helped them find their tents, were the Boy Scouts of America. And a few hundred scouts from Pennsylvania, from Washington, from Maryland, from Virginia, um, that came up to be a part of that experience, that sang the songs with their grandfathers, that were walking around the battlefield, learning about those things from their grandfathers. That the, the one story that's, that's in A Boy's Life from September of 1913 talks about how uh, one of those soldiers, a number of the veterans did pass away during those three days. These were old men. Um, one of them passed away in the arms of two Boy Scouts who were trying to help them. And that the power of that moment of being there to help and support, to give first aid, those were the things that needed to be passed on. Now they did it while also playing bugles. They did it while wearing uniforms. They did it while you know, being in, in an encampment that we often look at as being militaristic. But it was not war that they were celebrating. It was the moral equivalent of war. And, and I think about that a lot. Uh, because I think that that intergenerational experience, how do we pass on those most important values, is something we lose sight of. We're, we live in a culture that often focuses just on a specific generation, right? We just talk about the baby boomers, you know, or we just talk about the millennials. And we lose sight of the richness that happens when you exchange ideas and beliefs and stories and, 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 and lessons from one to the other. Now, I think AEE is different. I think we do this intergenerational thing very well. Tomorrow night is the Josh Minor Dialogue. And the whole purpose of the Josh Minor Dialogue is that we have an elder in the field. Um, Elder may seem like a strong word, but it's meant to be a very respectful word. Someone who's, who's had these adventures before. And they sit here on this stage, and they're interviewed by someone that they've influenced over their careers. And, and they sit and they talk, and they share these stories. Really, for, for the audience, it's this amazing experience to see two old friends share stories, and we get to kind of watch 
It's like the most voyeuristic <laughs> kind of thing ever. But, um, but an amazingly powerful thing. And, and, and it speaks to a richness. One of the greatest highlights of my life was sharing uh, a, an AEE Josh Minor dialogue with Rob Rubendahl, who I know is sitting over there somewhere, but I can't see you in the lights. Um, but that experience is, is rich, it's powerful. The kidference that's going on right now, the, the idea that we can take our children, those of us who are in this range of age where we have kids that, you know, aren't excited when we leave for the weekend, you know, and, and having a house for themselves. Um, that, but younger kids, and it, it's tough to go away and to leave them in the hours that we work and the things that we do, but man, to take our kids to be a part of this, my daughter's six years old, and this is her fourth AEE conference. For the last month, the first thing she says is, Dad, I can't wait to go to AEE. I just can't wait. She goes to like, all her teachers at the school know what AEE is. You know? I'm not, and I'm not the one going, hey, you should think about this conference. It'd be great. No, she's like, I'm going to AEE. And a month ago, she's like, hey, I just can't sleep. I'm just so excited about AEE. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she is able to be a part of that because we think about things from an intergenerational experience. The Elder Five and Keith King. Um, Chris mentioned Keith and that he's not here today. Uh, he is always here. Uh, and the thing about Keith is he personifies this idea of uh, of intergenerational experience, that he's been doing his work since the 1950s, that, that he is focused on engaging people of all generations to talk about what is this thing called experiential education. And when you sit with him by the Elder Fire, or if you travel up to Alton Bay in New Hampshire to, to spend an afternoon with him, which if any of you have the chance to do that, do it. Uh, and, and all you have to do is just send him an email and be like, Keith, I'm coming up. And he'll be like, Arr! And then he'll bring it. Sounds all like Grandpa April, really. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I, don't, I don't do a lot of voices. <laughs> um, but Keith will tell you that that experience does more for him than it does for you. And, and every time I've gone to spend time with him, he says, you know, you've got to come back and do this because this is... I'm not asking you to do this for you. It's not about you. It's about me. And, and I, I spend the rest of my drive home just being like, whoa, if, if it's as half of what it is for him as what it was for me, it was unbelievable. Um, but finding those times is so important and those experiences. The, the, so we do this intergenerational thing well, but we have a weakness in, in our culture as an organization. And the weakness is that we love creativity. We love to invent the wheel. And when we invent the wheel, we're like, dude, look at this! And we realize we just reinvented the wheel. Uh, I, I, I was reminded a little while ago, I, the, I remember a few years ago at, at, at High Five, uh, Chris, was, Chris Ortiz was talking about the, the ring game, right? In which, you know, they were just putting up all these different ropes courses where you have a ring on a string and a hook. And you're just like, and, and they're like, it's a simple game, it's awesome, it's great on ropes, it gets people engaged, it's so good. I'm like, oh, what a great idea, that's awesome. I found the directions for the ring game in a, uh, it was called the Boys Book of Sports and Games, <laughs> printed in 1864. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is this. Reinventing the wheel, man, we're never going to build a solar car, right? <laughs> so we've got to think about how are we transferring our lessons? How are we taking the lessons from one generation and, and move it forward? And, you know, I, I, I teach at, at Boston University School of Management, and I, and I work a lot with entrepreneurs and, and folks who have started a business and they've struggled, and, and they all say the same thing. They say, man, I wish I knew three years ago what I know now. And what I get to say is, so, so, what, what exactly do you mean? Because I want to know. Everybody says, ah, I, made, I, I wish I didn't make that mistake. And, and it's important to learn from our mistakes. And I want 
to make my mistakes. I don't want to make your mistakes. <laughs> and, and, and if I can learn from the mistakes you made without me having to make them, that's a pretty good deal for me. <laughs> right. And I think that's the magic of the intergenerational dialogue and the intergenerational experience. That we can learn what's worked and hasn't worked in the past. And we live in a different culture. Cultures do change. Otherwise, history would be really boring. And, and, and so it, it's important to know that what surrounds us in, in these mistakes that we make are, are different inputs and outputs. But, but there are themes. And there are important things for us to be thinking about. Now, why, why do I say, that you, why, what, what can you do this weekend about this? Because right, you may be getting excited about like, yeah, an intergenerational experience. <laughs> what should I do? Well, the first thing you should do is sit by the elder fire at some point this weekend. And, and you should spend some time with anybody who's there. If you go walk by that fire and there's no one there, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and when you walk by and you see someone there, join them. Especially if they're 10 or 15 years difference in age. If you came here with folks that y'all came down in a van together, <laughs> break up, <laughs> right? If, if you came, like, like many of us have come to see the people that we've seen for years when we come to these conferences, get out of that clip too. And, and be intergenerational and take that time. But don't just sit by elder fire. Go to a workshop with somebody from a different generation. Go for a walk. Go climb something. <laughs> go, go do something. And share and sing a song. You already know what, at least, right? And, and, and that kind of thing is so important. When you're sitting there thinking, God, I really do want to get out of that spot that I'm in and get cross-generational, think about, you know, the host committee. Because right? what you have with the host committee is a chance to work with some folks after, in a longer period of time, that will likely be different from who you normally work with. And so to say, I'm too young to be on the host committee, or to say, been there, done that, is a cop out. And not only does it deny yourself the opportunity to learn, but it denies that of someone around you. Think about what Keith says, that visiting him does more for him than it does for you. Well, those experiences aren't things like the host committee or NERAC or any of these opportunities that AEE provides. That, that's there for you, and it's a chance to have that intergenerational experience. Now, why is all of this important? It's important because we're in the midst of one of the greatest transformations economically, culturally, politically that has happened in the last five, six, seven hundred years. That the digital revolution that we're in right now is as significant as the industrial revolution was. The way our culture changes and is transforming is dramatically different from what we grew up with. And it, like right now, there's, there's five times as many words in the English language as when Shakespeare was writing. Every day, there are 4,000 new books published. Every day. There is more information in one week's worth of the New York Times than someone who lived in 1776 would have ever come across in their entire lives. The exponential growth of technology is such that if you go to a technical college, one half of what you learn your freshman year is obsolete by your junior year. Now, the moral of the story is not uh, that the robots are our new masters. Right? <laughs> that's not that's not thing. The moral is this: that memorization, recitation. Highly structured educational programs that were designed for the Industrial Revolution, ones that we ourselves are even guilty of calling traditional. They are not traditional models of education. They are industrial models of education. Those won't work. There are no bubble sheets that you can fill in that can prepare you for a digital world. And so what we need to be aware of is that in the future economy, as we're moving into the 21st century, the skills that are valuable are resilience, creativity, support, being able to read and engage other people, being able to think outside of the box, 
It's what we do. It's what we do every day. So the good news is that the future of education is experiential education. That you are on that cutting edge. You are on that wave that's coming. But the only way that we can do that, the only way that we can create a quality educational future for our children, all of our children, is that we think about how do we take the old grizzled wisdom of these guys who have been doing this for, in Keith's case, half of the 20th century, and combine it with tech-savvy millennials and digital natives and have a dialogue that brings those together. That's when we're going to start seeing experiential education really explode and, and really work its way across. And there are places that, that get that, that are doing that. And, and, and when you look at how you move beyond what we normally think of as education, how do you move beyond what we normally think of as, as experiential education into something different? It's going to make us uncomfortable. I remember somebody at some conference somewhere talking about like a comfort zone. Am I pushing it? I don't know. <laughs> but, I, last week, last Friday, <coughs> I saw an amazing example of this. I was at Plymouth State University. And I was, we all be excited about that. And I was at the Museum of the White Mountains, which if you have not yet been to the Museum of the White Mountains, if you run trips in the White Mountains, go through, see this place, it's awesome. It's this small old church that, that's a new art museum. It just opened a year, two years ago. It's their second exhibit right there. You're going to totally dig the title. It's called Beyond Grant, The Geology of Adventure. <laughs> and the idea was this. They wanted to take geology and recreation and put it together. But they wanted to look at the fact that the, the geology of the White Mountains, the rocks themselves, are what make skiing, hiking, and climbing possible. And that there is this engagement between the two. Now, when we started pitching this whole idea, Catherine Amadon, who's the, the director, was telling me that the, the initial conversations, and she's a climber and, and an art historian, and kind of gets that thing that's going on, and, and, and she was saying that in the initial discussions about this. The geologists were like the, seriously, the recreational stuff is not nearly academic enough. That's, no, that doesn't belong together. And the recreational people were like, look, seriously, geology? <laughs> <laughs> so boring. <laughs> and everybody's like, none of it belongs in an museum, right? <laughs> <laughs> But what happened was these things came together. And so you go into this exhibit, and she was telling me about the, the, the opening night of the exhibit. And you walk in, and there's you know, Cannon Mountain, and the images, and historical photos and things. There's uh, uh, pitons, and helmets, and climbing shoes, and harnesses, and rope from like original first ascents in the 70s that are in these cases. And then there's cool old skiing stuff. Um, from, you know, Tuckerman's Ravine, and, and there's great hiking and backpacking historical stuff and, and things about huts and, and, and Franconia Notch and just, it's, it's amazing stuff. And there's this kiosk, like an iPad, like in a thing so you can't steal the iPad, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and you can zoom in and you can touch little things and little stories pop up and it's this amazing thing. She said they put that online and they've had all these hits of these climbers that want to look in, and they use, it's a digipan, it's a super high resolution <coughs> image. You can zoom right in and, and really figure out your whole route up Cannon Mountain by looking at the way, just the type of detail, it's amazing. But, so, but what she said that first night, the exhibit was, were these old grizzled climbers who were like, this is never going to work. And these kids that I'm sure, younger kids are like, really, I, I have to bring me to an art museum opening, come on. And they were together sharing this experience, playing with that screen, looking at these old artifacts, looking at these old photos, and, and these maps, and these super high res things, and walking around and looking at the minerals that were there, and thinking about and talking about their experiences. And what 
it really was able to do is that these older folks, the older climbers, were able to share their adventures and their histories and their lessons with the younger kids who were then able to see in that past their own present and their own future. And that's what the intergenerational experience is all about. And that's what I hope you find here at APE. The, the last thing, second to last thing, because we're going to sing another song. <laughs> How many folks have heard of the Seven Generations Law of the Iroquois? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Seven Generations Law. The, the Seven Generations Law, I, I love teaching this in business school, because for students that are thinking about the quarter and, and our profit and our, our quarterly earnings, it's great to get them to think about, well, how is the impact going to matter seven generations out? Because the Iroquois law says that for every decision you make, you must think about the impact seven generations out. Now, it's tough for us to comprehend. And I sat down and I thought about it once. I'm like, God, what does that mean? What does it really mean? In 1845, my ancestors left Ireland as a result of the potato famine. They came to Boston. And this guy, Patrick Haggerty, worked the railroad. And he built the railroad, uh, or was one of the many Irish laborers that worked to build the railroad from uh, Boston to Fitchburg. Uh, ended up settling in Concord. If you read Walden, and he complains about the Irish, it's on <laughs> He built that railroad. He was part of that experience. I live in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, 45 minutes or a half hour north of Fitchburg. I work on Comac in Boston. I get there by riding the Fitchburg Railroad, the exact same line that he laid down. So for Charlotte, six generations separates his actions from her opportunity to live in the mountains of New Hampshire, in the Manadnock. That there is impact in what we do. Now he never, ever, ever could have comprehended what our lives would be like. And never could have comprehended how the work that he did working on that railroad would create a possibility for us. But that's what's great about the intergenerational dialogue and the intergenerational experience. It's the fact that we don't know where it's going to bring us. That's the adventure. But we've got to have it. We've got to have it. So, you want to sing another song? <laughs> yeah. We'll do one last song. <coughs> and it's going to involve a guitar. <laughs> now, the song we're going to sing, many of you may know. What I, when I was trying to think, what do we close with? Free bird. Free bird? <laughs> 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 you know, we used to do a global war and both thing. People were like, what is free? <laughs> AE conferences where the keynote flips you off. It's like, what is this organization coming to? Um, the, what's that? Yeah, there you go. So, so what we're going to do, the, the song that we're going to sing is one that, what I love about this song is we would always play this in, in Warrior Poet Shows, and people would come back years later and say, you are not going to believe this. I was in a bar in Lisbon, and they sang that song, and I knew what to do, <laughs> and I'm not Irish. <laughs> and I was like, well, now you know, man, you're part of the team. It's all <laughs> the song itself is about being a, you know, a young person, goes off on adventures that our parents disapprove of. They probably don't understand what we're doing. That was nothing you all could relate to, right? <laughs> you want to do what? You want to major in what? <laughs> and, and then you have your adventures and you come back and your parents welcome you back in. So it's, it, you know, it's that whole thing about, you know, graduating and move back in with your parents has been going on a long time, really. <laughs> um, it's called the Wild Rover. Um, and the chorus, the, the, the chorus says, and it's no nay never, no nay never no more. Will I play the wild rover? No never no more. 
All right, but there's the, the key thing is you, you, you got to get the clap in there too, right? Not the key. <laughs> 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 so, you're going to say, I'm going to say, and it's no, nay, never, and you're going to go, one, two, three, one. no, nay, never, no more. It's two. Well, I play the Wild Rover, no, never, no more. Okay? So, and then we'll try to sing it, we'll play it together, it'll be all good, and we'll be, we'll be and we'll, we'll rock and roll. Great. Yeah. I've been a wild rover for many years And I've spent all my money on whiskey and beer And now I'm returning with gold and great store And I never will play the wild rover no more And it's no day I went into a nail house that I used to frequent And I told the landlady the money was spent I asked her for credit, she answered me nay Such a custom as yours I can have any day And it's no
there, like y'all been sitting down for a long time. I, I know I'm long with it. And, and that was really the only reason you came here standing up. Cause you're like, I can't sit here anymore. <laughs> Anybody have any questions before we start playing games together? Yes. How did you find your beautiful voice? <laughs> About three in the morning. <laughs> That's, 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 that's. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the thing is when, it, how many folks grew up in an Irish American culture that, that know these songs, know this stuff? It, you grow up singing, and it, it's just part of it. You know, I, I, Charlotte's known the Wild Rover since she was in utero. <laughs> <laughs> she, that, was, that, was first, that was her first kick, was going. <laughs> but, yeah. Hey, other questions? Awesome. Thank you all very much. Go have great intergenerational experiences. Um, what a, we're going to bring the lights up, I think, or, or else it's going to be the weirdest game to tag. <laughs> Take your chairs. Hold your chairs. Put them off on the side. Is that what you're Oh, hold on. He's got, he's got something. Oh, wow. It's so dark. Uh, before we move chairs and everything, uh, I just want to take an opportunity to thank Kutch. I, this is my fourth host committee, my last host committee, uh, uh, and having been part of these for the last couple of years, usually it's one that you get into this brainstorming of, who are we going to get to keynote, and it takes a while, and when Hutch's name came up, which was actually a recommendation by Phil, the room just got silent, which we often know doesn't happen with people who do this type of work. Especially when I'm in the room. Especially when I'm in the room. So I was a little tentative in Denver approaching Hutch to do this, and immediately the go on his face was, yes, we made the right choice. And I remember sitting with Hutch in a corner, and he's singing, and I'm doing exactly what we were just doing, and people were walking by us wondering what the hell was going on. Uh, and it was just this idea that Hutch had had, and I thought it was fantastic, and I was so excited that he was willing to do this and willing to do this for all. So, another round of applause. We can sing pirate music all night! Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, lot of yeah. We need a little booty shaking later, but that will happen with open mics and all that. Um, so, what we're going to do now is myself and several of our good friends who will become some of your best friends, hopefully, over the next couple of days are going to have a little bit of fun, and hopefully you will too. But in order to do that, we need to facilitate, and the facilitation is to pick up our chairs.